Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for our time to come together and discuss your word. There's so many things in there. Um, John has opened our eyes to ways to really understanding more deeply. And the more deeply we understand, the more mature we come in our walk with you. So I just pray you would speak to us today, um, help us share, and help us just to grow together as a fellowship, studying your word um, under you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this format will be very different than anything we've done before. Nobody, there's nobody that could substitute for John Drivis. Um, his style, his depth, his way. And so we wouldn't even try to kind of continue on um, as John does. So I thought, well, I put out a request trying to find um, a substitute. And we did have a couple of possibilities, but just the timing um, conflicts wouldn't permit it. So I thought, well, let's just get together and use this time. Um, many of us feel like our day is not really starting the way it should, but we're not able to kind of get together in these studies that um, I really think that um, Barry and Life Resources opened up the way for me to begin my day is when I can have these studies and I almost wish I'd had them every day. Um, but I wanted to go ahead and use some of the things that John had taught us and and just have a discussion. We're just going to have Bible discussion right now. So anybody um it's not, nobody's like leaving or teaching. We're just all sitting here. Um, we might have just some fellowship where we get to know somebody better based on the scriptures they like or et cetera. So I wanted to start on Wednesday, uh, Lane Kasich is doing a study on Genesis. And in going back and looking, I found this extremely interesting and, and kind of mind blowing. So this is one thing I wanted to bring, um, the Hebrew and the English. And if you look at the genealogy from Abraham to Noah, um, this came, excuse me, from this K-House organization, and it's an article. If you look at the, the genealogy from Adam to Moses, you kind of came up with a gospel message um, or God's plan hidden in there. So it says man was appointed mortal and in sorrow, the blessed God shall come down teaching, his death shall bring the despairing rest or comfort. And when I, and when you realize that, if you go back, that's Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Malahel, Jared, Enoch, um, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. When you go back and you look at the scripture, this is the gospel message. Man was appointed as mortal, man will die and live in sorrow, but the blessed God will come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest or comfort. And your mind's not blown by that hidden gem within Genesis, um, then I don't know, for me it was. So what this led me to do is like, okay, I wonder what happens if we look at the genealogy from Abraham to Christ. And, and sure, I didn't have enough time. I didn't study this like, and I didn't go to some detail where maybe I could break it up like um, Adam to Noah, but I found it really interesting if we did the same thing. So exalted father, and there's, a, I will tell you, there's a few that I can't figure out how they would fit in here, but I thought the message was pretty good. So we have exalted father, laughter, heel catcher, praise, Breach or burst forth from walled town, high and exalted, my kinsman. Enchanter, peaceful, swiftness, servant of God, the Lord exists, beloved, peaceful, and enlarged people. God is father, healer, God has judged, God is exalted. The Lord is my strength, God is perfect, he has grasped, God strengthens, he causes him to forget, to carry to support, God will fortify. I have asked God, sown in Babylon, my father is majesty. God will develop a helper, a righteous justice. God will establish. God is great. God has helped through the gift, the heel catcher. He will add, the Lord is my salvation, Messiah. I also thought it's interesting because when you look at Hebrew, it goes in the other direction. 
um, it, if they read not from left to right, but they read from right to left. So you can do the same thing back. Messiah, Lord God, or Lord is salvation. He will add, I'm not sure how the heel catcher fits in there, the gift. God has helped. God is great. God will establish righteous justice. He's the helper. God will develop my fat father's majesty sown in Babylon. I have asked God and God will fortify to support and carry me to cause to forget. God strengthens. He is grasped. God is perfect. The Lord is my strength. God is exalted. God has judged the healer. God is father of an enlarged people, peaceful, beloved. The Lord exists. Servant of God, swiftness, peaceful enchanter, my kinsman or noble, high and exalted. The walled town burst forth, praise the heel catcher, laughter, exalted father. So I can't, I mean, I'm not going to say that this is an absolute also hidden message, but it just shows us that the Bible, if you want, if you are interested in poetry, then you can go dissect the poetry. If you're interested in genealogy, you can dissect the genealogy. If you're interested in almost anything, it's given to us in the scripture. So I'm going to go on now and do what John does with the interlinear Bible for a couple of verses that we were looking at or that I've come across. But I wondered if anybody has any comment here or thoughts based on on what we just presented here well one thing too i think i this you you did the other one was k house which is dr chuck missler right and chuck missler is is a great guy to follow if you don't know who that is he's he's has passed away uh several years ago but his his work is still out there at uh, uh k k house or it's conia uh, house. K K K K house but anyway he he gets into a lot of the stuff that annette's talking about that's finding patterns in the bible patterns of seven go into the revelation is one set of sevens after another why and he really gets into that. Uh, and that first one that was done, he actually, that came from him. Uh, that came from uh, Dr. Missler. So I would encourage you that if that's the kind of thing that intrigues you in the Bible, he has some really, really good stuff about, you know, the, the Hebrew is, is what, right to left? And guess what? Everything... East of Jerusalem is left to right. Everything west of Jerusalem is right to left. Is it that? Yes, yeah, it's, it's swift it's world. It's opposite. West, west is left to right. West. Oh, yeah, I'm going the opposite yeah. way. Yeah, I, I always screw up where Jerusalem is. But, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, an, it's an interesting diversion if you want to get into that, that sort of stuff. The things that he has gone through... Because we have the Bible automated today in just about every language, and with the power we have with artificial intelligence today, the power of going through the Bible and dissecting it, looking for stuff, is way beyond man's capability uh, even 10, 15 years ago. So it's really, really interesting when you get into that level of exploring the Bible and how true the Bible is. Any other comments? I think that it's very amazing how the completeness of the Bible reveals itself to us as we study it a little bit deeper. And uh, through these studies, I've learned to look deeper into it. Um, I don't read a lot because of my eyesight, because it my only eye that I see through um gets tired, but uh, I try to read as much as I can, and it's like, this is a complete book showing me what the people that Jesus walked with were experiencing and the prophets prophesizing about, and how truly that that can open a light up to us. It's just amazing how it does that. And uh, John's study, which I, I truly enjoy, and uh, 
I just enjoy doing this because it seems to bring some completeness to what I'm trying to discover and uncover about what God is saying. And the amazing part about it is that Jesus walked with his disciples and they were a select group that uh, had the advantage of walking with him, but we still see the fear that they had for their lives because they were attached to him. And, you know, sometimes we get like that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but God's there. God's there. He's in those pages. Um, and David, I just enjoy your comments and your study. Um, you're a good guy. Thank you. A couple of things there that you mentioned, and I just won't give you, I get, want to give you some feedback is, uh, I don't know what you have, whether it's a, an iPad or a, you know, Microsoft computer or laptop or whatever, but all of the Bible in the Bible app now is audio. I do it. Okay. And then a lot of the Bible studies and devotionals have now been put in audios. Oh. And so you can listen, have a complete devotional that goes into scripture. And if you look at the Bible app and you look at the devotionals, every one of those devotionals are in audio as well. So oh. you bring those up and then play the audio and you don't have to strain the eye looking at it. And it's very, it's very good stuff. And I do that. I do that. I I learned to do that early on. And I, and prior to some of our sessions I've had, I've turned it on and I've read read that chapter to get the wholeness of it. Or I didn't read it. I listened to the audio, and they right. do such a wonderful job. the The voice, the voice is just one that says, "Wake up, I wake up." I do the same thing. First thing I do is that in the morning. Yeah. It, it just thing. starts the day off. Yeah, it does. Nelson? Yes. Hey, uh, Charlie. I don't oh. know if you uh, remember, Moses was the first that brought down the written word on a tablet from the cloud. Yes. From a tablet yeah. from the clouds. There you go. And I have the eye cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. Yes, Dave has some quotes. I, I have some quotes because I you know I look at different things and uh you know, I think Barry Handel has had some of these quotes, if not all of them in his uh his his Bible uh studies, but I think this is interesting as we go through this, and I just want to read these really quickly, but starting off with George Washington and how important it is for us to recognize that our country came from Scripture. It came from the Holy Bible, and our forefathers were almost all Christians. The reason why they came here is because of being persecuted in, in really Europe. But let me go through some of these things, and it's not just forefathers, but these are quotes. I, I'm getting them from someone else, and I think they came from Chuck Missler. Uh, but George Washington said, it's impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. This quote was unknown, but it says, no person's education is complete without their knowledge of the Bible. It doesn't matter what you know if you don't know the Bible that's what you're missing. And so there was a quote by, you heard it, Jack of all trades, master of none. That's misquoted. It's actually Jack of all trades, master of one. And that master of one is God's word. So everything else is minor. Master of one is God's word. I think that was Benjamin Franklin. Uh, don't quote me on that. Abe Lincoln. I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All good comes from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. 
Patrick Henry. The Bible is worth all other books which has ever been printed. For the past 2,000 years, it's a treasure that millions willingly died for, yet all tend to take this for granted. Napoleon, the Bible is no mere book, but it is a living creature with the power to conquer all that opposes it. Let me go down to Daniel Webster. If we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But we, but if we and our posterity ne neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden the catastrophe may be overwhelming to us and bury all of us in the glory of profound uh, obscurity. Listen to what that's saying. What happened to America? In 1963, we took the Bible out of the school. Daniel Webster's prophesizing, and I don't believe that he has the cable to be a prophet. We, I won't get into that. But the fact is, you take God out of America, and we don't know when it's going to be a catastrophe. It is. And this is, this is a, I bring that up because this is in John's heart as well, almost every Friday, is look at how this reflects the minor prophets on what's happening here in, in our world as, as well. So it's really interesting if you look at statistics from the time we took the Bible out of school. Divorce rates are 400 percent, you know, single uh, parent families are like a thousand percent. I mean, you go on and on and on and on is what has happened since we've taken the biblical word out of our school. It's just unbelievable where, where it is, has progressed. So all of it, I think, is so important. We look at the Bible and we look at all this is going on and look at all these people in the past that are telling us. How can we ignore it? But a lot, a lot of people still just ignore it. It's just a book. It's just a book written by a bunch of different guys around the campfire. It's uh, that's all it is, and that's out of pure ignorance. I'm sorry, they've never read it, <laughs> and they never probably will. But it's our job to communicate it. So I'm going to turn this back over to Net because I think she wants to get into this inner linear study of the Bible. Uh, which I think is is so very important. It's make, it's meant a lot to to her. So it really has revolutionized. Um, this has revolutionized the way I read the Bible. I can't just sit and read it anymore, um, which sometimes now makes me go way. I go way slower, obviously. But uh, in I'm doing a, a study through the Bible app that's called Chronological. And it starts with um, reading in Genesis, but then it'll throw Job in there. there it, you're reading it about the order that it should have occurred in history. So I'm in 1 Samuel this week. I've, I've kind of passed it, but I was in 1 Samuel. And it, it got a little confusing because it said the next, so 1810 says the next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in hand and Saul hurled the spear for he thought I will pin David to the wall, but David evaded him twice. Now it goes on a couple of more times to say um, another kind of spirit, uh, an evil spirit, etc. So I'm thinking as I read this, if you just read it, either you can just read over it and not even pay attention to what you're reading. But then I'm starting to think about everything I read. So this one said harmful spirit. The other one said an evil spirit. So I thought, okay, is God sending demons uh, upon Saul to bother him, you know, to cause him problems, et cetera. And so in going back to the original word, now the, the, the red words are where we are able to um, go back to the Hebrew, this is Hebrew, and discern what they're saying. So the spirit is the breath that is used for the spirit, but in this context, the harmful spirit meant a troubled disposition. So he's not talking about God sending a, a demon to possess Saul. They're talking about God permitting this troubled disposition, this unrest in him, this emotional. 
I've the next verse that I went to was in 19 and I became confused because I said, okay, how is it that God is sending a deep before I got to my interlinear Bible, because I was reading both of these chapters at the same time. How is it that God is sending a demon onto Saul and then, uh, then having him prophesy? So this was just all extremely confusing to me. So I went back here and I found that this is not, this is not a demon. This is a troubled disposition. But then when I go here and this prophesying, I'm thinking, okay, he's using him as a prophet, even though he's given him a demon. No. So it's just a troubled disposition. He's at unrest. He's unhappy. And the spirit, which is the breath of God. And this was Elohim. So it's the God who judges. The spirit or the breath of God who judges came upon him, Saul. Because prior to this, I didn't have room really to go into it prior to it. You know, David was with the priests and he was prophesying. And then the men that were with him, the breath of God came on them and they were prophesying. And now Saul joins them there and he's prophesying. And what that meant is in the oldest forms, it's a religious ecstasy with or without song and music. So I think that they were in worship. They were caught up in the spirit in worship. Um, later on, it became religious instruction. And there's a occasionally predictions, but John has taught us before that prophecy doesn't necessarily mean future predictions. Um, it, it often is more current term. Um, and so I believe that through studying this scripture, we're able to look and see that um, God who judges came upon Saul and allowed him to enter in a time of worship with or without music. And I'd say with David there and the, how much Saul really reacted to music. We know that David came into his life to play music and calm his spirit. So I think possibly he was worshiping with music. Um, and that's what it means. He was not being used by God as a prophet. Um, so any comments about these types of observations? You go back to to uh, Samuel 18.10. Uh, it's interesting. I use the King James. And that's not. But uh, when it says in the King James, it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came from Saul, came upon Saul. Well, I don't know how you translate that, except you look at the word God used here. And it's the word Elohim. The judge. And the Elohim yeah. is many gods. So where was the spirit from? It's Ruach. Is the word Ruach is in there. And 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 the and the word for God is Elohim. If if it had come from our one single God, that would have used God would have used Jehovah, Yahweh. And so I, I interpret a little different than that. I'm I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just you know, trying to parse the words like you do. And in reading King James, uh, it, it looks to me like uh, that the gods, you know, and you, you go right now to the book that Jonathan Kahn has written about return of the gods. Uh, and you almost come to that conclusion. I'm not saying that's right, but that's, you know, certainly an interpretation that can be taken. Are you able to... <laughs> Are you, can you see the interlinear Bible here? No, I don't see it. I, I, I see, see your my... troubled, troubled disposition. Okay. I see so that. Let me do this, and now let me share again. I'm, I like what you what you did, and I'd like to be able to go back and forth with it. So now you see. Yeah. Okay. So let me make this a little smaller. Okay. So this is great, and this is what I hope would happen. So. From God is Elohim. And so as John teaches, we can come up here. And this is the divine right. the ruler. You're right. The rulers, the judges, the angels. But then we do have, oops, sorry, I can't move that. We do have the little G gods. Right. And then God or goddess, God-like works or special possessions of God. 
and the true right. God. So Elohim is a difficult word to digest. And so again, I can click on that word and then I can get some more. This is how I go. Uh, let me go out. Let me it. Let me do it. Yeah, let's go. So then we have the divine ones, superhuman beings, including God and angels. Right. So that what does make that right. No, I'm I'm showing it's it, it that's what makes it. So this one definitely I did too quickly. I would say I I did it too quickly, trying to prepare it for this. Oh, this is second Sam. Is no, that no? Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, first second eighteen ten, and then the spirit again. We can see. Is the breath of heaven, the wind, but it can be temper or anger or impatience or spirit or disposition. And so, and that distressing, that's what that word is. Disagreeable, malignant, bad, unpleasant. So, and I think that I, I, I'm using ESV. So it's a little different than the King James and the word evil that you have here is probably the same word. Yeah, bad. Yeah, evil. the evil is so, the same. The Hebrew would be the same, yeah. yeah. So, see, we see that that's very interesting. So I'm going to stop the share here really quick and go back to the slide. I, I mean, this is one of the wonderful things about studying this way. Uh, yes. You know, how do we understand the word of God unless we are able to parse out each individual word? Now, because we come to perhaps different understandings of that word uh i don't think that means a lot i, th I only think it means that uh, god's word is spoken to a variety of people people with different backgrounds different understandings different hopes different wishes different everything else uh different anxieties frankly and so god speaks to that person somewhat differently than the other because to move the person forward and toward him, he needs to understand the way, you know, God understands us. So he presents it in a way that brings us forward closer to him. And and I, I think there's plenty of room to interpret it either way in that. And I don't certainly don't disagree with what I'm seeing in your translation. I'm just saying that, you know, uh, I just think there's a, a, a lot of different ways. And I don't think it affects the overall direction of where God's leading his people. Now, if you want to believe God brings an evil spirit upon people, that's up to you. Or if you want to believe that God is bringing, is bringing okay, a, a difficult situation, uh, that's okay too. Uh, but the point is that each one of us have to understand. I personally believe there are a lot of evil gods, okay? A lot of them. And and God has addressed that many, many times. And I think he's addressing that right here. That the, the, they're evil, evil spirits. Ruah is the word used. And I don't know how you translate ruah except breath or wind or what. And and uh, so I, I just find it very interesting. It, it can be translated in many different ways, but consider your whole existence, your whole life, your whole being, and who you really are, and what moves you. God's intent with these words are for instruction, for correction, for direction, for all of the things that God thinks that we need to move toward him in sanctification. You agree with that? Yeah, I do. And, and, and when I'm just to just to verify or to what I was thinking, because as I try to reconcile what this is saying, I, I found it hard to say that God is going to send an evil spirit or an evil that God doing. But I more or less, as you said, God knows us. And I think he without like the move, without the Holy Spirit or without prompting Saul away from that, let Saul go into his own natural. You know, he permitted him without addressing let him just have his evil disposition well but, i mean that, yeah that's possible too you know there's a lot of people who don't believe that people can be uh possessed or oppressed by evil spirits they think it's 
and believe, and, and maybe rightfully so, I'm not saying they're wrong, uh, that people act upon their own accord. And, and there was some sort of mental problem with Saul at that point. Now, what was the cause? I don't know, you know. I think and it, I'm just... it's interesting because at this point in time in the history, the Holy Spirit hasn't been granted to everyone. Yeah. To reside. And we know if we have the Holy Spirit in us, the 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 demon can't enter our body. The evil right. spirit cannot enter. It doesn't stop us from being influenced. Right. Right. <laughs> but it can't we can't be overtaken by it. Right. You know what the Bible says about the word of God? It's a sharp two-edged sword, sharp enough even to divide between the soul and the spirit. A lot of people can't understand the difference between the soul and the spirit, and it's very hard to. Uh, but the, the word of God can discern between those two. And the word of God can discern between demon possession and demon oppression. But that's his job. That's not yours or mine. Wherever the evil comes from, it's still evil, isn't it? You know, and and I I don't I don't cut people slack when they create evil. Uh, I don't care if it's them or if it's an evil spirit driving them. All I want to do is somehow or another inject the spirit of God before them, so that they have an opportunity to change, to repent. You know, I. I don't know how else to, to bring it. That's, that's really the way I feel. And and I don't know whether right or wrong or indifferent, but that's how I have to conduct my life, I think. Annette? Yes, sir. Uh, in your prior uh, reading um, in Samuel, uh, you went on to talk about the evil spirits being sent by God and that you perhaps maybe didn't quite understand how that could happen. And it reminded me of the debate about the devil and God and Job. Yeah. And in that debate, the devil basically challenged God, you know, as well, yeah, it's easy for Job to love you because you've blessed him with all these things. And God essentially turned the devil loose on Job with the restriction that he couldn't touch him, uh, but that he could essentially, you know, cause Job all sorts of losses. And and if you read that story, it wasn't a story about, oh, look what happened to poor Job. You got to take the backstory. What yeah. was going on between the devil and God? And did God send the devil? Or did he just let the devil have his way up to the point of not touching Job? So those are uh, some insights on, uh, if you will, the evil spirit uh, being sent by God in, yeah. in Saul, with Saul. Yeah, I think so. sent or allowed. It's a, yeah, allowed. I like, I like the word, word allowed because Colin, I, or even in our study, uh, presented the fact that if God knows no evil, if God does no evil, if God is a good God, and everything from God is good, then he's incapable of doing evil. But yet he destroys Jerusalem. He allows the people to be slaughtered. And so you start you start wrestling with that concept. Well, God doesn't do evil, but look what happens. Look at the evil in the world. Well, the world has been is just controlled by Satan. And Satan is evil. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's really kind of you have to recognize the fact, uh, even I think with the story of Job, I think God allowed it. 
but God didn't send that to happen. And right. I think there's a, there's a difference there. And I think that I think that's that's part of the word that's correct. I I don't think God did. Elohim did. Whoever Elohim is in this case, yeah. uh, he sent the evil spirit, and that that's the gods, the rulers of this earth, who's Satan. And I I, I think that that's applicable in, in a number of cases in the Bible. You know, I think uh, uh, God's look. Just take a look at America today. We've done that in the studies of uh, of the minor prophets, and we can see very very clearly that. Things are not what they used to be in America today. Do you think God sent an evil spirit to America to destroy it? No. He's just backed up. Remember, remember part of the study we had sent the canker worm, he sent the da 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 worm and the other worms and all, all of these destroyers that were sent. They, they weren't his, but he sent them to make destruction. What was his eventual punishment or what was his eventual chastisement he backed up he just simply backed up now in america when god is told leave the classroom guess what he's going to do he's going to back up and i think at that beginning place and i think it was said rightly so is when america's difficulty started because god just simply backed up you don't want me fine See what it's like without me. And and I think that's essentially what's going on. You know, I, yeah, it's, it, it could be a lot of other things, but that's one that I believe, certainly. Unfortunately, Herb, if you just look at history, and, you know, I grew up, I didn't like history. Yeah, you know, I'm, a, I'm a math guy. I'm a physics guy. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a technical guy. History was boring to me. But as I've matured over life, you know, I found out history is so important so that we don't make the same mistake our forefathers or people before us made. And that's why it's so very important. But you look at what you're saying and what I have recognized is that we, we, I think everybody here for the most part, has came up at a time of prosperity. Your, America grew. We, had, we went through a couple of bad wars. We came out of that. We came in, in, in prosperity. And what happens is as generations move, they forget all that stuff. And all of a sudden, it's their human nature that starts taking. It's like we're, we live in a me world today. It's all about me, what makes me happy. It's not anything of how to serve a neighbor or anything else. It's what makes me happy today. And what we were doing is we're leaving. We have a new generation coming up that doesn't know all that we knew. And that's what's happened to Israel. Look at Israel. They would come, they would do good for a while. They'd have a good king for a while. God would, would allow them to prosper. And then they get a wicked king. God backed up, as you said. And they went, oh, sorry, went to hell in a handbasket. Amen. <laughs> they did. They did. It's very interesting. So I've got one more of these. And then we'll, uh, and then this is all that I had put together. But so Dave and I, we we are leading um, a, a, a study of the book of James on Tuesday mornings. And if you like this kind of dialogue and you haven't really participated, I think that you would really enjoy because this is kind of the way we go, except for we don't just pick a bunch of random verses. We're doing verse by verse in the book of James right now. But there's, we're coming up to talk about judging. And so Dave and I had this conversation back and forth, back and forth. Our breakfasts are really interesting. I love them because we get into these deep discussions. But we were talking about judging. And so we thought, you know, he was saying, okay, we're looking in James and what that is. And what is it meaning in Matthew? And because it says people, we think people say, um, judge not that you will not be judged. So I can't judge anybody. I can't judge anything. Live and let live. This has been so abused, I think, in our current Amen. culture. And so we said, well, what does this mean? Judge is by making a judgment. It's either a positive verdict in favor of or a negative, which rejects or not or condemns, not 
that you be judged, that you be not judged. For the judgment you pronounce when you are judged with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So this isn't telling me I can't judge any situation or I can't judge just whatever you do, that's good because it's you. It is not what this scripture is telling us. We can make a positive judgment or a negative judgment about every situation or about what we see happening or what we think somebody is doing. We can do that. But the whole thing, if you go further, we have to be careful of because only God knows the heart. So when this person does a certain thing and I pass a judgment, say it's a negative judgment, um, a, a rejection or a condemnation of what they're doing, I have no idea of their heart, what led them to do what they did, what is the circumstances surrounding it? I don't know that. And that's what this is talking about. Be careful about how you judge, because if I have no grace in the way I judge or no mercy in the way I judge other people, I am going to be judged in that manner. And this is sobering. I mean, I'm, I'm not worried about whether I judge or not. I'm worried about how I do it. And if I'm able to, to take a situation that I see and say, okay, God, and, and I'm, I'm working through that. I see that this is kind of coming about for me. If I see something and I want to pass a judgment on, I'm like, okay, well, I don't understand this. I don't understand that. Um, I don't know what they're doing. It appears to me this, but I don't know the background, et cetera. So um, this we're going to get into a lot more detail on Tuesday morning at 730. If anybody would like to join um, that doesn't already have the links, let me know, and I'd be happy to send it. Yeah, and where this comes from, interesting, is that it's actually verse 13 of the second chapter of James is what led into all this. And what we're trying to show you is all the bunny trails he's going to run down. It just makes it unbelievable. But if you look at the second verse 13, it says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so th that's where all this into Sermon on the Mount, we know that a lot of James references are back to Sermon on the Mount. We know that James, for most people think that that's the half brother of Jesus. He was he may have been at the Sermon on the Mount uh, when, when Jesus did that uh, discourse. But the fact is, is that that judgment he's talking about goes back to Sermon on the Mount. That's what led us down this. And the fact is, is that I think once you looked at the two judgments here, even in James, even though it's interpretive judgments, it's they're they're different. One is uh like a tribunal. Like a tribunal. And the other one had the word added divine to it. Added divine. So one was more of a man's judgment, and the other one was a divine judgment from God. Again, you don't know that unless you dissect and look at the scripture and take a deep dive. So it was very interesting as you go through this and you say, well, when you have questions, does this really mean that that's when you have to dive, I think, into the inner linear? Why would uh, why would God say in Micah 6, 8 uh, that what what shall you do, O man, but to do justly, to love mercy? And to walk humbly with God. Yeah. So we are to do justly. Yeah, justice is, must prevail in the earth. And as we see justice as it is, and justice means to pronounce a verdict, yeah. guilty or not guilty, uh, do justly, but love mercy. You know, uh, God wants us to be more like him uh, than we are like ourselves. I yeah. mean, I'm... Yeah, no, I'm perfectly ready to punish somebody that hurts me or my family, but that's not where I can go anymore. You know, I, I know better now. I know that what God wants is he wants mercy. That doesn't mean judgment doesn't take place. It yeah. just means that judgment is his. Right. And it's interesting, Herb, as you mentioned that, because, you know, when, how all this ties together just... You know, we're 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 doing the mind of prophets. We uh, John's doing it. Then we've got the study of Genesis. Then we've got the study of James. We've got all three of these going on at the same time by different people. 
yet they overlap one another. Yeah. What they're doing so much is unbelievable. And yeah. when you get into where we are with Genesis and where, where Lane is, he's into uh, dispensation of the government, human government. Well, God has put us in a different dispensation of now being ruled by authorities and government. Well, he gave that authority to us. And we are expected to have trials and process people that are guilty and actually punish them that are guilty. So it's a, it's it's part of what God has given man, and that's the human government, to control good and bad that's on the earth. The issue is, is when the government is not led by the Bible, that's where you run into real issues at. But the fact is, I find it interesting how people, and and that knows when we got into some of the commentary, and he say, and they say this goes back to judge not that that be not judged. That has been taken so much out of context because they don't read the rest of what Jesus said. He said, "Don't judge if you got a log in your eye. Take that log out of your eye first. Then you see clearly to judge your neighbor and take the speck out of his eye. So it never says don't judge. It says don't don't be a hypocrite. You know, don't don't be out doing the worst there is and then criticizing your brother for doing something that's really minor. You you have to bring it out, but you can't be the hypocrite in doing it. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting how all this ties together. Does anybody have another scripture they'd like to look at or point at? Or I think Dave had a, a little thing that it, it's a know. little it, it's a little bit of a different. It's not going to be looking at a verse. It's going to be looking at a concept. Um, but did anybody have a scripture they wanted to look at before we went? Annette, would you go back to Samuel when uh, Saul uh, decides to uh, uh, pin David? Could you pull that back up? Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Herb, did you know that this inspired David to be a country western singer? The title of his song was Saul, oh, he really misses me. I can't wait. I think Saul, I missed Saul, he really misses me. He saw him. Yeah. He, okay. Because he evaded him twice. Uh, oh, it came off the archery team. <laughs> Look, uh, sometimes God uses people like Saul to throw, you know, spears at us to get us moving in the right direction. No doubt. And no, no doubt. And I I don't know if any of you observers observe Dave's hands when he is teaching us. Dave is a man who speaks with his hands. I know it. I know it. <laughs> and and I don't know why, Dave, but it reminded me of my childhood days of puppets and <laughs> puppet shows <laughs> and and i it made me realize that god is using you dave like a pup <laughs> at, like a puppet with his fingers <laughs> causing you to uh share god's word with annette and uh, barry and me and nelson amen and and god <laughs> uses you in a very mighty way dave and uh <laughs> And Lord help us if you ever break your hands, <laughs> you know, you, uh, you know, we'll have to change the uh, script to a new cast. Or, or if it gets way uh, wrapped up in what he's saying, I might have to start ducking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he's. There's only to... one. Re I have only one request when you do that, Dave. Don't put it in front of your mouth. Okay. <laughs> Some of us are lip readers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, unless somebody has a specific scripture they'd like me to pull up on the end of linear Bible, Dave does have something to wrap up in the last 10 minutes. Yeah, it won't be that long. Okay. Just, just, this is, it's a good 
Yeah, well, it's it's something that we put this together. It's just it's something that uh, has stuck with me for a good while. Actually, I did a sermon on this uh, a couple of years ago, but I first heard this at a funeral. Uh, and the guy that was doing this did the uh, the funeral service, and it's uh, the, it was it was labeled "Who do you say I am." And where where I'm going with that is we're talking about the Bible. We're talking about understanding the Bible. We're talking about going into interlinear Bible, looking at what it says, how it's all tied together. And what I want to do is finish today with why is that important? And it's important because you're going to be asked that question. Who do you say I am? Jesus is going to ask, who do you say I am? If you look at Jesus, he says, I am. The prophet that's coming after Moses. I am the Messiah. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Truly, truly, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's the son of God, the God in flesh. That's the answer to the quiz. Who do you say I am? But the problem we deal with is if you ask someone, you know, are you a Christian? Well, I'll go to church. Uh, I'm Baptist. I'm Methodist. I'm Catholic. I'm Pentecostal. I live a good life. I do mostly good. I do believe there's a God. I have been baptized. I've actually gone and been baptized. Will that person die and be in heaven or will that person die and go to hell? That's the question. The, the point here is it's not important about you and who you are and what you do. The only important thing here is who is Jesus and what did he do for you? And do you believe in that? And all this is what I'm saying is so very important. Because that's the final question as you get up to heaven. If there is such a question in heaven, again, it's just an example, probably a metaphor that he was using. Uh, but I found it was really touching when you're at a funeral. And the person, you don't know the person that well, whether that person's going with knew God or didn't know God, or did they know God supernaturally and have God living in them? Or they just, as John so carefully puts it, knowing God doesn't get you, get you there. It's acknowledging God and accepting him as your Lord and Savior would get you there. You know all the world, but you can quote every verse in the Bible. That's not going to get you to heaven. The demons know the demons know God and fear God. So anyway, I just wanted to end why all this study of the Bible is so important. Why are we spending our time in the morning doing this? Because it's it's our destiny, it's our eternity. It's the most important thing we can possibly be doing. No doubt. So anyway, that's the that's the only way I wanted to end this, is that stuck on my heart. You know, the, when, when particularly the funeral, you know, the last opportunity for that person, that last breath, you don't know whether they knew God or didn't know God at that last breath. The funeral, it's all over with. God's grace, God's mercy, God is gone after you die. You got to do it before you die. That's the one thing you have got to do before you die. And that is know God and trust God. Anyway, so much of that sermon, I'll get off the horse. <laughs> if, if there's any Dave, comments. Dave, I'd like to follow up on that. Uh, and I'd like to follow up on it, that it's not a end of life question uh, or post-mortem question. It is really a question in the present tense. Mm -hmm. And I mean that in the most sincerest sense. It's not a question to be put off to or your, uh, you get your diagnosis, or that you're uh, getting the last rites. Uh, 
no, it's a question if you haven't answered it in the present tense, ask Jesus to repeat the question. And Jesus mm -hmm. will repeat the question to each one of you. Not, you know, it's, it's not who do you say I am. It's not who do they say I am. Or oh, what do they say about me? Or what do you say about me? The, the importance is in the pronouns. The pronouns, if the pronoun is not singular, second person possessive, you miss the train. In other words, if you do not say, Jesus, I say you are my, and then blank. Yeah. If, if you can't address Jesus, Personally, if you can't address Jesus in the pronoun I, you, and my, you're missing the boat. Because unless you take possession of Jesus in the very many ways Jesus offers Jesus to you to be taken and possessed, the most important, which is savior. But on the other hand, before savior, uh, Jesus might just reach down and grab you out of the water because you lost faith and you were sinking. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind that Jesus wants you individually to use that second person possessive pronoun in your relationship with Jesus. Jesus isn't looking for you to report, oh, Jesus, I've I found out you're very popular now on the search engine. They say that you're number three on the most searched uh, <laughs> sites. <laughs> or, or, you, you know, you're tuned about saving uh, the sinking stone. Uh, that's a really a, a you know soaring to the top. Yeah. That's not what is going to be important for your relationship with Jesus. It's how you relate to Jesus in a personal, possessive manner, and that's my uh, insight on pronouns and relationships and Jesus. Amen. And I, I appreciate it, Collins. Uh, I, I see Nelson. Let me say one thing and I'll turn it to Nelson. <laughs> I totally agree. It's not a end of life question. It's a it's a question today. Because when you accept Christ today, you accept you get eternal life today. You get hope today. You get your peace today. You get joy today. You don't have to wait till you're into life. So I just I, I appreciate you bringing that up because the way you brought it up. I, I may have not presented that the correct way, so I appreciate that. Now, Nelson, I know you had the hand up. I did, and um, all of you inspire me to be more like Jesus. And Colin, you just worked my pronouns and everything, and it says, I am. What does that mean? Well, at the moment, just now, it's it made my brain click, and it said, be a reflection of I am. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we did that? And Colin, thank you for that. Nelson, you are. You are. Amen. Yeah. Her? I have a, a, a scripture that tells me that if you're going to make that decision, make it as early in your life as you can, especially as a child. That would be wonderful if you made that because I made it in 1974 and it was all the way until this year, however many years it is, 74 to 23, it took me to find this one promise. It's in Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, this is God speaking, for I know the thoughts that you think, to, I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I don't have to worry about a thing. 
God's going to give me deliverance from evil. He's going to give me peace. And most of all, he's going to give me an expected end. Wouldn't that be great to know when you're a mm -hmm. young boy? You know, I think anyway. And yeah. I guess it took that long for my faith to build so that I could really believe that. But to know that, that, that it's God himself that is going to bring me to an expected end. And I don't know about him, but I expect a lot. And I think he probably expects a lot. Too. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> but it's a great well, script. That was a great way to end this class. It's it, We're out of time. And I am praising God. I was just struggling because I was trying to get a substitute and we didn't get one. And I didn't, I mean, I like to honor John feels very strongly about, about his fellowship being fed and he doesn't like to take breaks. And, and so y'all have made this an amazing time together this morning. Thank you for joining. I don't feel like I had a waste of my time at all. I feel uplifted. Um, I feel that we got some really good truths out there and it's not stuff that I think we as believers don't know. We do. I think we're pretty strong believers that attend this class, but mm -hmm. it's stuff that we have to be reminded to share. And how many times has Herb said, oh, we need to share it. We need to be telling people this. We need to not keep it to ourselves. And so thank you very much for joining us today and participating. Um, I think it was really beneficial. Well, it was for me. So maybe I only did it for my, my benefit. But y'all, thank you very much. It's always this great. This is the best thank conversation you. I've had in a long time. Yeah. Great. <laughs> great. Thank you. It really is. Let's close in prayer. And we don't have to hang up then, but we'll close in prayer and 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 get on with our days. Great. Our dear Lord, thank you so much for this word. But you know what? Again, I say this frequently, but thank you for each person you ordained to dial in today or click in today. I thank you for for touching minds and giving us ideas and helping us to share those because we all benefit from that. We all grow from that. But dear God, I pray that I don't just take this discussion today and that I think, wow, oh, that was a great way to start my day, but that I, I think now, how am I going to hand it out? How am I going to disperse this? How am I going to share this? And so I just pray you speak to each one of us because the time is urgent and there is not time to wait to share you with, with those we come in contact with. So dear God, make us, help us to be obedient, help us to be receptive, help us to be watching um, and for your leading and to share your word in Jesus name. Amen. 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 God bless. So and every time we if get anything together, it says about John, it says he is teaching very well. Yes. Our study uh, conversation is a lot deeper in scripture than most people's. And I think he has a great deal to do with it. Frankly. He has everything to do with mine. Yeah. yeah. Amen.